You know, since the outbreak of the pandemic, I've been asked two questions over and over, um, primarily from people outside of our network of churches. Uh, first of all, there are the end times questions. Um, Andy, do you think the pandemic is a sign that Jesus is about to return? Um, is this the beginning of the end, the apocalypse? Um, and then there are the judgment of God questions. Andy, do you think God is trying to get our nation's attention? Um, is God judging our nation? Should we call the nation to repentance of sin so that God will remove the virus from us? And honestly, um, praying and repenting of sin is never a bad thing, right? unless it becomes a distraction from the main thing, which we will get to in a minute. Now, I totally get what's behind these questions because of the type of church um, that I was raised in. Uh, people are asking these questions because, well, it's based on the way they were raised, their worldview, the church they grew up in, um, the worldview they were presented with, left with, left behind with. Anyway, these are interesting questions, but as we're gonna discover, and as you would guess, these are not the most pertinent or the most important questions. They're not helpful questions. In fact, to the point of today's message, they are not the kinds of questions that first century Christians ask when faced with similar circumstances. And just my opinion, I, I think our fascination with these kinds of questions reveal in some cases a limited or perhaps, a, well, a limited knowledge or a limited understanding of history and of the suffering that people in other parts of the world have had to navigate for generations and that many people were navigating in this generation before the appearance of COVID-19, which makes me wonder, perhaps the question that we should all be asking is this one, why? Why do Americans, and I'm including myself, why do Americans have such a low pain threshold? Because we really do, don't we? Again, me included. I mean, and part of the answer to this question is we're so blessed, we're so resourced, um, we've been so protected and those of you who have traveled to different and difficult regions of the world, you, you know this to be the case. You know that us Americans have high expectations of how we expect or deserve to be treated. Um, we don't wanna be told no. We feel like we have the right to do pretty much whatever we want. Um, and in fact, think about it this, the, the fact that, <laughs> that fights, the fact that fights have broken out and guns have been drawn over wearing a face mask in Walmart um, on airliners, I mean, that should tell us a little bit of something about our low tolerance um, for discomfort, our it's all about me centered culture, a, a culture that's becoming more rights than responsibility driven. And let's face it, when individual rights, when individual rights take precedent over personal responsibility, when individual rights become more important than taking personal responsibility, <laughs> perhaps the end is near. Perhaps an apocalypse is just over the horizon because you can't create, you can't pass, you cannot enforce all the laws necessary to ensure peaceful coexistence in a culture where personal responsibility takes a back seat to personal freedom. I mean, I could state it this way, it can't be all about me and all about you all at the same time. Somebody has to give, something has to give. Somebody has to surrender a bit of their personal freedom or chaos will ensue. And I know this, the notion of surrendering any personal freedom strikes us as so un-American, but we do it all the time. At least I hope you do. I mean, every time you stop at a four-way stop and let the person to your right go first, um, every time you wait in line at the grocery store, I mean, we raise our children to say no to themselves in order to get along with other people. But when I and when you refuse to take responsibility, for ourselves, what do we do? We force somebody else to take responsibility for our irresponsibility. And that can only go on for so long. And all of that, all of that, along with our varying worldviews, our varying theologies, um, the ways that we were raised to see the world and interpret the world, all of that feeds our curiosity and fascination with interesting, intriguing, but in the end, unhelpful questions related to the suffering that many of us are experiencing, or in most of our cases, the hassle and the inconvenience inflicted on us by the coronavirus. And that brings us to the point of today's message. And that's this, what questions should we be asking? What questions should we ask? And when I say we, I'm talking about we the church, um, we being the church, what questions should the church be obsessed with? Um, where should our focus be? Where should we focus our energies? And the interesting thing is this, 
the New Testament makes it crystal clear what kinds of questions the early church asked when faced with problems they couldn't solve and when faced with a natural disaster that for whatever reason, God chose not to withhold. Now, here's a little context, and this is so important. Um, after Pontius Pilate, um, after Pontius Pilate gave in to religious leaders in Jerusalem and ordered Jesus to be crucified, it was pretty much open season on Jesus' followers. The religious leaders, think about this, if you've read the New Testament, the religious leaders didn't drag anybody else to Pilate for execution. They just took it upon themselves. And their first victim, as you may know, was a man who had been chosen by the apostles to distribute food to widows. His name was, that's right, his name was Stephen. Stephen was officially the first Christian martyr. But as it turned out, Stephen, in addition to being able to serve widows food, he had some other sweet skills as well. He was a powerful, powerful communicator and a persuasive litigator for the faith. So the religious leaders in Jerusalem, they had him arrested they tried him for blasphemy, <laughs> but during the trial, they made a crucial mistake. They gave Stephen an opportunity to defend himself out loud in front of a crowd. And it was a mistake because his argument for the faith was so compelling, it just made them all mad. And they dragged him, not to Pilate, they dragged him outside the city gates and they stoned him to death. A horrible way to die. In many instances, the victim didn't die immediately. They were left to bleed out alone as animals gathered around to be the first to feast on the carcass. Now, when there were no negative repercussions from Pilate when they stoned Stephen, the religious leaders started rounding up all the followers of this Nazarene sect, members of the way, that's what they called it then. Luke says this, on that day after the stoning of Stephen, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles, Jesus' original followers, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. They could no longer meet together safely and they could no longer meet together legally. And the result, what happened? So the Jesus movement ceased to be as its leaders were eventually rounded up and executed. No, that's not what happened. Of course it didn't, just the opposite. Those who had been scattered, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. The fact that they could no longer meet together in Jerusalem did not dampen their enthusiasm. It turns out the persecution served as a catalyst to spread their faith to regions that, well, had yet to hear the message of Jesus. Now, as you know, if you grew up in church, the chief inquisitor or the chief persecutor was a man named Saul of Tarsus. We know him as the apostle Paul. He literally, during this season, this is amazing. He went from house to house, imagine this. He went from house to house in Jerusalem, dragging men and women out of their homes to be tortured and imprisoned because they had embraced the way, this Nazarene sect or cult. And then, when he ran out of Christians, they weren't called Christians yet, but when he ran out of Christians to arrest in the greater Jerusalem, Judea area, he got himself deputized to arrest Jesus followers in Damascus and to bring them all the way back to Jerusalem for trial, which is crazy because the trip from Jerusalem to Damascus, I mean, get out your map. The trip from Jerusalem to Damascus, one way would take him nearly two weeks that's how intent he was about putting away once and for all this thing called this Nazarene sect, the way, the followers of Jesus. But as you know, on his way to putting the way out of business, he was intercepted by the living Jesus. And he immediately, he immediately abandoned his violent ways and he joined the losing team that eventually lost their way to victory and shaped Western civilization. And Paul, as you know, uh, eventually went on to write a series of letters that shaped Christian theology for the next 2000 plus years. So recap, here's, here's the picture. Christians are scattered, smothered and covered. They are despised and they are dispersed. But what questions were they asking? When they got together, what did they talk about? What were they most concerned about? What did they focus on during those days? Well, the story continues and Luke picks it up for us. And here's what Luke says. He says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. 
Some of them, however, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch. Antioch is over 300 miles north of Jerusalem, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, not just Jews, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with this group and a great number of people, Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Now, pause for just a minute in the story. Would it be great if this was the church's story of COVID-19? Wouldn't that be great? When those who have been scattered by the virus recognize that they could no longer gather as they had in the past, they look for new opportunities to spread their faith in Jesus. As I've said before, I hope that's your story. I hope that's my story. I hope that's our story. Anyway, back to their story. Turns out that so many non-Jews embraced Jesus as savior in Antioch that the believers in Antioch sent a message to Jerusalem said, hey, we need backup, we need help. So the church in Jerusalem then sent a guy named Barnabas to Antioch to help disciple and teach all these new believers. <laughs> when he got there, so many more people responded, he needed backup as well. So he went and recruited some extra help. Luke says this, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, the apostle Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch to help him out. So for an entire year, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the reason there were so many people was because of the disruption and the persecution 300 miles south in Jerusalem. And here is the interesting and the instructive thing for us. There is no indication there is no indication that first century Jesus followers in Antioch or Jerusalem tried to figure out how all of this disruption and all of this displacement and all of this persecution played into some larger eschatological framework. They didn't interpret the persecution as a sign of God's displeasure with them. They just adjusted to the new normal and they just kept going and God honored it. And interestingly enough, as you probably know, it was in Antioch as a result of widespread persecution that the Jesus movement finally got its permanent name because the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Then this story takes a really interesting twist. Um, in fact, it's this twist that leads us to the opportunity that lies before us today. Here's what happened. During this time, during this time of uncertainty, during this time of disruption and persecution, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, one of them named Agabus, stood up in front of the church in Antioch and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. Now, the term famine, that's, that's a term we associate with ancient times. It's not something that strikes any fear or dread in us, but a famine in ancient times meant that perhaps an entire village, an entire town, in some cases it would seem an entire generation would starve to death. This was the worst news imaginable. And this person said a famine is coming and it's gonna spread throughout the entire Roman empire. It's not a localized famine. You won't be able to leave town and go buy bread in another town. It's gonna spread throughout the entire region. And here's something interesting as well. Luke, who is writing this several years after these events, reminds his first century readers of the actual famine he references because many of them had lived through it. And he reminds him, he'll say, oh yeah, you remember this actually happened during the reign of Claudius. Claudius was the emperor right before Emperor Nero. And then once again, this is so interesting. Once again, these first century believers, they've just gotten this horrible news, horrible news that's gonna impact everybody they know, including themselves. They did not respond to this terrifying, devastating news with questions about what it meant, what it pointed to, they didn't ask, what does this portend? You know, what does this portend about the future? Is this an omen? Is it a warning? Is God judging the Roman empire for her cruelty and immorality? Apparently they didn't ask these questions. Is this a sign that the end is near? They just didn't worry about those kinds of things or there's no indication or record that they did. What they did instead is they asked far more practical questions helpful questions. After all, now they're Jesus followers. So they ask questions in keeping with the teaching of Jesus. Practical, here and now questions. 
author um, and Bishop N.T. Wright um, commenting on this passage summarizes their questions this way. I love this. He said, when they got together and realized something dreadful was about to befall them, here are the questions they ask. Number one, who will be at risk? How can we help? Who should we send? Isn't that great? Who will be at risk? How can we help? Who should we send? Now, this group in Antioch, they were well aware that the threat of the famine posed a threat to their families and their own livelihoods, but they paused. This is so powerful. These are brand new believers. They paused to consider the implications for Jesus followers in other areas that would be harder hit, specifically the plight of believers in Jerusalem, because when this famine swept the empire, Jesus followers in Judea would be particularly hard hit because they were already considered outlaws. Most of them couldn't work. They had been expelled from the temple. They were poor and they were vulnerable. So the believers in Antioch saw this as an opportunity to resource the less resourced Jesus followers all the way back down in Jerusalem. And again, instead of sitting around talking about what does this mean? They looked around and they got busy. Here's what the text says. The disciples, as each one was able, this is so powerful. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, it says, this they did by sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So what began was this long process. It's so fascinating to read about. This long process where Barnabas and Saul began taking up a collection for the Christians living in Judea, specifically Jerusalem. And they were the gift bearers to make sure that these brothers and sisters, that the people in Antioch had never even met would be resourced during a difficult time that would impact everybody. But here's the part that's easy to miss. And it's really impossible for us to appreciate. Again, Jerusalem was 300 plus miles away. Now, let me put that in perspective for you. From Georgia, I can get to New Zealand or South Africa and back in way less time than it would have taken someone back then to travel just one way from Jerusalem to Antioch. That if you look on a map, these two cities were an eternity apart. And culturally speaking, they were half a world apart as well. These were Gentiles in Antioch, Gentiles who thought the Jews were a strange people. I mean, they could have easily excused themselves from any responsibility to help people, well, people they would never meet in a region of the world that they would probably never visit. <laughs> Besides, again, this was gonna be an empire-wide famine. They would be affected as well. They would need to care for their own. And then there was something else at play here as well. Um, what is commonplace for us, what is commonplace now, actually what's considered virtuous now, virtuous to us, was actually unheard of in ancient times. Generosity towards someone who could not or would not be generous in return. In those days, that was not considered a virtue. It was considered weak. Why would anyone help someone who could not help them in return? In ancient times, that was ridiculous. That was a loss because there would be no return. That kind of generosity wasn't considered commendable. Again, it was just foolishness. You gave in hopes of getting, you did favors in hopes of receiving a favor. Besides, they didn't even know these people and they weren't their people. I mean, the people who received wouldn't even know the names of the people who gave. In ancient times, honestly, there was no category for this until Jesus until people began to understand the implications of the gospel. When presented with the message of Jesus, these Gentiles had come to accept the fact that they had a sin debt they could not pay and that God through Jesus paid that debt. They had been given peace with not the fickled gods of their childhood. They had been given peace with the living God, the creator of all things. And now they were to do for others what God and Christ had done so generously for them. As Jesus followers, they were now accountable to the law of Christ. So when the opportunity arose for them to give with no opportunity to receive, they gave willingly and they gave 
generously and never before, this is amazing, never before in recorded history, never before in recorded history had a local multicultural group as you find in Antioch, felt familial kinship responsibility for a group of people with whom they had virtually nothing in common and had never met. And where did this politically, culturally incorrect behavior come from? It came from their recognition that God so loved the world that he gave. It came from their acceptance of the fact that by that kind of generosity, all men would know that they were Jesus disciples. They gave because that's what love required of them. And here's the cool thing. Those are our people. They got the ball rolling. They were the first push on that flywheel. They introduced a new kind of generosity and eventually it would have a name. It would be referred to as caritas. Caritas, a brand new category of generosity. A caritas was giving to relieve the physical or the financial distress of others without expecting anything in return. And that brand of generosity would eventually brand Christianity. It would become the hallmark of the church. So taking a page from our first century brothers and sisters, our primary responsibility is not to figure out why the pandemic happened or to react to the various theories of its origin or to figure out how it fits into the overall sovereign plan of God. That doesn't really help anybody. At best, it just leaves us debating among ourselves. And if the apostle Paul was right, and I believe he was, the pandemic, It is simply another global expression of a broken world awaiting its redemption and its redeemer. In other words, this is nothing new, but the question is, what should we do? And this year, be rich is a big answer to that question. It's our answer to that question. Now, if you're new, once a year, here's what we do. We combine all of our resources to do corporately what we do all year long individually, give, serve, and love in Jesus' name. It's our opportunity to remind our communities that everybody, everybody matters to God, whether God matters to them or not. Now, we call it Be Rich based on what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in a first century letter. Here's what he wrote. He said, Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world. And if you have more than you need by international standards, you're rich. Command those who are rich in this present world to do good and to be rich, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. Now, here's the thing. Most of us want to make a difference, but we don't always know how. And be rich is how, and be rich makes it simple. This is our 14th year. This is our 14th year. And over the past 13 years, here's what you've done over the past 13 years, you have served, you have served over 466,000 hours with our nonprofits. And collectively you have given over $51 million that we in turn gave away. This year's campaign is gonna involve 68 churches around the country and around the world in 21 states, six countries, which includes over 113,000 people when you add up all the folks who attend all those churches. Now, from the beginning, and this is so important, from the beginning, we have partnered with rather than competed with the fabulous nonprofit organizations in each of our communities. In the Atlanta area, we call these partners our intersect partners. And we have 27 intersect partners surrounding the city of Atlanta that we work with all year long. And we work with them all year long on the, in the areas of food insecurity, uh, foster care, medical care, housing, and education, just to name a few. And then in addition to our stateside uh, intersect partners, we have 13 international partners that we work with through Global X. So if this is your first time, here's how it works. For the past several months, our staff has asked some of these extraordinary organizations in our communities, they've asked them two questions. What would make a big difference for you? What would make a big difference for you? And what would help you make a big 
difference. And so as they have given us that information, as they've answered those questions for us, we have vetted a couple million dollars worth of projects. But um, with Be Rich, just so you know, we do not set a financial goal. Our goal is 100% participation, 100% participation. We are asking 100% of those of you who can to give, and then we are giving 100% of it away. And the good news is this, there is still no price increase and there is no adjustment for inflation. We're asking everyone who can to make a one-time gift of $39.95. And if everybody just in our Atlanta area churches participates at that level, we will collect about $2.1 million today. And that will cover about 50 projects. But because of your history, we've vetted another $2.5 million worth of projects just in case this year is like previous years. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping this year is the biggest year ever because the need is greater than ever. This year, we're gonna fund projects similar to, like, similar to the ones we've done in the past. We're gonna fund some local foster care initiatives, something near and dear to our heart. We're gonna fund support for families living through childhood cancer. There are a couple of organizations, one in particular that we love to partner with and have for many, many years that makes an extraordinary difference in the lives of these extraordinary families. Um, we're gonna fund one of our, lo our global uh, projects is we're gonna fund two border stations that rescue girls from trafficking. I can't tell you what country this is, in, but these border stations um, rescue uh, about a, a little over a hundred girls per year. So we're gonna fund two of those. Um, also, we're gonna fund the operating costs for some of our nonprofits. Um, here's what happens with nonprofits. People love to give specifically to needs, but nobody really wants to give to the office cost, the cost of running an organization. So we come in behind these fabulous organizations and we fund some of their operating costs, as well as we fund some staff positions for some of these organizations. In addition, we're gonna fund some COVID related support for local schools. The need there is greater than ever, as you know. We're gonna fund mentoring and housing for homeless teens and young adults, a need that is growing, especially even in the suburbs uh, around a city as large as Atlanta. And then this is so exciting. We're gonna fund some sustainability projects. Um, the nonprofits that we work with are so incredible. They're constantly looking for ways to create revenue within the organization. And in many cases, they just need some startup costs. So we're gonna fund some of these projects so that they will become more self-sustaining over time. Now, as you would imagine, these are game changers. These are game changers for our partners. And more importantly, these are life changers for the people they serve. And here's what's so fascinating. It was the first century church as we've just discovered. It was the first century church that first understood and embraced this novel idea that devotion to God is best demonstrated and authenticated through our love for others. And you know what? That extravagant generosity toward others is the appropriate, it's the appropriate response to God's extravagant generosity towards all of us. That shift, um, that approach, it had a ripple effect throughout the entire Roman empire. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that our generosity in Jesus name has the same effect on our communities and perhaps our nation. Now, normally at this point, I would dismiss you to the lobby where volunteers with different colored balloons would be ready to accept your donations. This year, it's a lot simpler because I want to dismiss you to berich.org, berich.org. I want you to go there immediately and I would love for you to give generously. Let's show our communities that our faith is more than just sermons and songs and that our churches, well, we are certainly not closed. So on your mark, get set. Let's be rich.